I tell you, we've had a cold winter here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm about ready for a little summertime, y'all. He's Nashville's nice guy. I'm going to the bus. I'm going to the holler. A man with a warm-hearted baritone. I'd working all summer just to try to earn a dollar. Who could sing the phone book, and it'd probably be a hit. Every time I call my baby, try to get a date. The boss says no dice, son, you got to work late. He's country's Sometimes storyteller. Alan Jackson. You want to sing them songs about life and love and heartache and drinking and dancing and having a good time. You know, all these little things that have always been in my mind when I think of country music. Basically just what makes up life, you know, what you go through. Whose car is barking next door? There's no flash to Jackson, just a man and his guitar. But he had a blinding ascent to the pinnacle of country music. 60 million albums sold. His latest, Angels and Alcohol. Go on and leave me, baby. I don't need you. I got Jim and Jack and Hank. Comes 25 years after he first topped the charts back in 1990. But here my voice has gotten deeper in my old age, but other than that, it's, but yeah, I don't quite sound quite as happy like this as I did on that first album. But yeah. Living that honky tonk dream. At his home, outside Dashville, there aren't enough shelves to house the accolades that have poured in since then. He can count among his fans, even those who once lived in the White House. Oh man, I'm out of place there. <laughs> Golly. He's never forgotten the night he ended up next to President George W. Bush at a state dinner. They brought out this bowl or something and it had this liquid in it. And President Bush leaned over and said, don't drink that. You're supposed to wash your hands in it. <laughs> I said, OK, thank you. <laughs> well, way down yonder on the Chattahoochee, it gets hotter than a hoochie coochie. Jackson is country through and through. He grew up in tiny Noonan, Georgia, about 40 miles southwest of Atlanta. His music speaks to life's simple pleasures, farms, family, and fishing. Did you catch all these? Caught everyone, yep. Did you really? Yep, I've caught about everything in ocean I, that I wanted to catch. <laughs> when Daddy let me drive. His attic is a place just for his toys, especially anything with a motor. But it's a 1958 Panhead, which was the year I was born. Long before he was handy with a guitar, he proved he was handy with a wrench, a love of tinkering he got from his dad, Eugene, a Ford mechanic. That pretty much explains why his desk is a 66 half-ton pickup. How many cars do you think you've had? I'd be ashamed to say I, I, several hundred. Really? You and, think several I mean, even before I moved to Nashville, when I didn't even have a dime, you know, I'd, I'd already had a tons of vehicles. I'd buy them, sell them, you know. His songs are vehicles, too, but not in a glory days kind of way. In their simplicity, there's a certain wisdom. I still don't know where all that comes from. I just, you just be driving down the road, and all of a sudden this melody and some idea <laughs> coming to your head. Where were you when the world stopped turning? And that said to day. That's what happened with his haunting 9-11 anthem, Where Were You? I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I just woke up, and there was this, it was just a chorus, you know, and I'm just a singer of simple songs. And, and the melody and everything, and I, I, I would have forgotten it probably by morning. So I got up in my underwear, went downstairs, and, and taped that. And how many days after 9 11 was this? It may have been a month. Did you burst out with pride for the red, white, and blue? And the heroes who died just doing what they do. You know, a lot of people were writing songs about that day, and I didn't want to feel like you were trying to jump on the bandwagon and take advantage of something like that, and so I didn't really intentionally want to sit down and try to write anything, and it's a hard subject to write about. Did you lay down at night and think of tomorrow? Go around and buy you a gun. The record ended up pretty much word for word as it came to me that night. As well as it did, you were sort of uncomfortable with the attention that the song brought to you. Well, I've had so many people tell me, you know, I was feeling that same way or I did that same thing. People started looking at me different, put me up on this pedestal like I was some kind of saint or something, you know, and I was like, man, I'm just a singer of simple songs, and, it, and that's the truth. Where were you when the world stopped turning? Truth is, fame fits him like a 
bad pair of boots. Being the center of attention is the last place Jackson wants to be. If you had just ended up being a songwriter, writing for other people to go on and become rich and famous, would you have still been happy? You know, I really believe I would have because I still uh, self-conscious about going on stage, much as I love singing and I love sharing my songs with people, especially for something I wrote, but I still feel a little uncomfortable in front of people. And 25 years of doing it hasn't made it any easier. It was about an hour before he was due on stage in Nashville when the nerves started hitting on his tour bus. I'm pretty laid back, you know, uh, as far as that goes. I don't do any crazy stretches or, or do anything weird. And, you know, I might have a shot of Jack Daniels or something. But uh... <laughs> His wife, Denise, helps calm him down. Two young people without a thing Say some vows and spread their wings. High school sweethearts, they were married at 18 and moved from Georgia to Nashville into a tiny basement apartment. We brought our first baby, Maddie, home to that basement apartment. And so then we were still living there when I had my first number one record. We stayed there until we were sure I was going to make a living. <laughs> but the miles away from home took their toll. In 1997, he and Denise separated after he admitted to having an affair. But they soon reconciled. Denise even wrote a book about it all that went on to be a bestseller. I was gone a lot and, you know, vulnerable and just made some bad choices. And I think it was, uh, I was worried about people knowing about that. But, but then again, it was, you know, I'm a person, just real. You know, I'm a human being just like anybody and make mistakes. And I think it was even better to see that we survived that and have, have, have uh, turned it around. Besides their three children, perhaps nothing symbolizes their romance better than the car where they had their first date, a 55 T-Bird. Jackson had to sell it for a down payment on their first home. But years later, Denise tracked it down and gave it to Alan as a Christmas present. As the garage door comes up, he sees that it's a 55 Thunderbird. And he said, oh, you bought me a car like mine. And I said, no, Alan, that is your car. The car. Still give me chill bumps. And OK, said. the man broke down and cried. His passion for making the old new again is everywhere, whether it's his cars, his relationship, or his music. Remember when dirty same soul At 56, the white-hatted man from Georgia can look in his rearview mirror with pride, remembering what matters most in life while still focusing on the road ahead, which, for Alan Jackson, seems to have no end in sight. Remember when